Hey guys, this is Navanad. Welcome to the second video in my conceptual series on poker edges or the three P's in poker. Uh, what we're going to be doing is looking at these three edges pre flop, hand selection, post flop, skill advantage, and position. Utilizing position to uh, win more pots, um, make better decisions, and uh, really just better control the, the size of the pot um, with more information about our opponent's range than he has uh, about our ranges. Uh, post flop skill edge is going to be uh, thinking in terms of our range, our opponent's range, um, how those ranges interact with the boards and the textures and what our relative hand value is, uh, how to take default lines based on relative hand value, and how to adjust them based on the uh, opponent mistake propensity, the mistake propensity of the opponent that we're playing against. And we're going to be talking about pre-flop hand selection. Uh, we're about to go into an actual uh, game that I played uh, just a few minutes back before making this video. Uh, just a six max uh, tournament syndrome. Um, it was a uh, $12 buy-in I believe. Uh, so we'll also be looking at you know, pre-flop hand selection in terms of uh, open raising, uh, steel versus re-steel situations. Uh, I did a lot of ISO raising and I'm going to recommend that you, if you're not already doing a tremendous amount of isolating versus limpers when you're playing, especially I think sit and goes, but even in cash games, uh, pay attention to kind of my general thought process and you might uh, you might decide that it's a good idea to add it to your rep repertoire. And uh, again, it's uh, small stakes, six player sit and go, and just try to pay attention to my basic range construction, uh, the post flop lines I take, and where our positional awareness comes into play, and how we're able to take advantage of position uh, in order to get more bets in when that's the game plan. Uh, save ourselves bets when that's the game plan and put maximum pressure on our opponents when we uh, do decide to like, barrel off with a, with a big bluff. Uh, probably I'm going to have to split this into part one and part two. So without uh, further ado, let's uh, get right into it. <clears throat> so we start off with a pretty good hand, uh, ace-jack offsuit from the small blind. and. Um, this is the, the first hand, or this was the first hand. I, I think I think this guy's going to act, and then there's going to be a hand. Okay, so right off the bat, we get a limp. So when we get this limp in late position, we know some things about villain, but we also have a decision to make, and I think our decision is pretty good ISO. Um, we don't have position. Uh, we may not have, we don't really know how much fold equity we might have straight away, uh, but we certainly have hand strength, and we're going to have some fold equity. And uh, now we see this flop, and we really need to start doing some thinking. Um, what's the best line we can take? And it's going to depend on our opponent's mistake propensities and the ranges, but as a very general rule of thumb, when you flop a good top pair, top kicker, especially on an A-side board, you're going to be continuation betting a lot of the time when you miss. Uh, you're going to probably just be going for two or three streets of value depending on the run out. Uh, so I think then you know, we know we've got a value hand and uh, we just have to decide what the best way to extract value is uh, considering what ranges we expect our opponents to have and uh, the board texture. So we get another opportunity to make an ISO. It's not quite as clear or clean but still a good ISO. Uh, we have a hand that's going to flop pretty good, especially against one opponent. And if we think, as it se as seems to be the case, uh, that at least the number two seed is going to check and fold and play very straightforward, and this is flops, then uh, it should be okay. And the number three seed, just the fact that he limped in to begin with to open a pot means he's probably not too good. We're playing against players that are kind of fit or fold fish. We can count on them to not get real tricky post-flop, and if they whiff, they're just going to check and fold. Uh, and if they do hit, they're going to go too far with their hands, and they're going to allow us a chance to put in bets and get value a little bit thinner than we might otherwise expect. Now, this didn't go quite our way, but it's interesting to note that he did not uh, lead 
he didn't uh, try to do anything fancy pre-flop, and he did not lead the turn when we checked back in the ace peel. And you've got to constantly be working in these games. You really need to be taking a lot of notes and then applying those notes. And uh, you get another opportunity to make an isolation raise. And uh, these are just really, really good and valuable raises. It's such a good play. Again, if you're not using it, if it's not a part of your arsenal, and I'd say a pretty big part of your arsenal, you really need to think about it. And there are three ways that... Uh, Isolating can be good, or there's three factors uh, that need to be taken into account when thinking about making an isolation raise. And those three factors are hand strength, position, and fold equity. Now in this hand, it doesn't look like we probably have that much fold equity pre-flop, but I think we can expect our opponent to check fold a ton of flops. Uh, we got kind of a surprise back raise, which is definitely something we want to take a note of. We want to see how he reacts on this board. Now we also have to classify our hand. We have like just pure nutted value. We need to think about what the best way to go about extracting value from this hand is going to be. And I think we can count on our opponent to make more calling mistakes than any other type of mistakes. Um, if he has like a single diamond, we'll probably get value from it. And we want to get as much value from single diamonds as we can before the board runs out with, without another diamond. And we want to get value from like top pair type hands before the board runs out with a diamond. And also, it's good to start setting up stacks, you know, setting up the pot size to get stacks. And we have another big hand in position against uh, a pretty weak field, so another really profitable scenario. And we flopped an over pair. I think the line should be pretty obvious here. It should just be uh, that flop, that turn, that river on most runouts. Um, and not all runouts, and maybe not even most runouts, but definitely we're betting most turns. And of the turns we're betting, we're betting most rivers. I guess if we add them together, at some point we may check a street back. More, more than half the time, probably. So yeah, we always have to be staying busy. And one of the things that I think uh, that is important to do is to look for signs of life. Uh, that's what I call... Uh, any indication that our opponent might know what they're doing. And the five seat gave us a sign of life when he chose a very appropriate and specific bet size. Um, it's not that easy to get to an exactly 75 chip bet uh, at this blind round, so um, it's probably not an accident. He probably had a plan for it, and because he had a plan, or if we assume he has a plan, then he must at least be thinking. We also know that he hasn't been super active, he hasn't been limping in at all, and he has. Uh, the I think one time he did enter a pot, he ended with a raise, and then he see about the flop, so he's starting to look like a tight aggressive player. We don't know that for sure yet, and that's why I put question marks on there. I start to knock those question marks as we go along. Just keep taking notes. If you're not in a hand, you should be writing things that, I mean, anything that's uh, going to help you to um, identify what type of opponent you're playing against uh, in some future hand or what he anything that's unusual, anything you can use, anything that's going to make your decision making process easier thereby allowing you to make fewer mistakes and therefore more money. Um, I don't think I took a note of it but I think I should have noted the big bet size from our uh, player two here. <clears throat> And it's definitely noteworthy that he fired with top shot. I mean, it was a wet board, so almost anyone's going to do that. But some players will try to slow play and get really crafty. At least we know he's not going to do, um, you know, crazy things like checking that flop. So it's something, and I think it's worth noting. Um, if your uh, note pad situation gets a little bit crowded, you can just start taking things off. No big deal. Start taking the things out that aren't as important. Start condensing them as you go. Let's start to think about the types of hands our opponents could be. What kind of ranges our opponents could have. And uh, look at the bet size. And this is big. I think that's another good, noteworthy piece of information. Um, and especially unlike such a blank turn. 
we don't know what that means yet because we haven't seen a showdown or anything that you know can help us to infer what it could mean. We've got a really good seat draw here too. Uh, we've got you know, the loose, like the weak loose players to our right, and the one tighter player to our left. And that's prime position. So here we are. We have. King Jack suited, which is going to crush a lot of the range that I would expect with limp in, and then call an ISO raise, so it's a really clear ISO. We've got position. We may or may not have a lot of fold equity, at least pre-flop, but we should have some fold equity post-flop if we think our opponents are going to play pretty fit or fold. <laughs> and I do think that. Okay, now we need to play in a line. Uh, what does our hand look like here? If we get a check, can we bat and expect to get called by worse? And if so, how many streets are we going to get? Like, that's the first thing you should really ask yourself is, how many streets of value would I like to, to get out of this hand? And I look at this and I think, I would like no more than two bets to go in. Uh, if he's going to voluntarily put one in for us, I think that's great because we can expect him to be doing this. Uh, if he's donking a flop that is a board texture that he ought to expect us to see bet most of our range on, he probably doesn't know what he's doing which means that he's probably donking things like draws, bottom pairs, and maybe some random button clicks. Um, this is really putting us in a tough spot, but I think we need to ask ourselves, if he knows what he's doing, why would he take this line? And really, I don't think he would. Um, so he doesn't know what he's doing. You read his notes and find out what kind of things he's been doing wrong and how he's been playing, and I think it makes for a call. It takes a what would be very borderline, maybe even a fold, and turns it into a call. Now, if we'd seen that player donk betting top pair or donking sets, uh, we would have taken a note of that, and then we could have probably folded that hand. Um, but on a board like that, it really just doesn't make sense for a villain to be donk betting for value, which means we shouldn't be donk betting at all. And once we did make the call and found that he was in there with just some random button click, like no pair, no draw, I think, um, it really just makes the, the call makes me feel that much better about the, the line I took. Um, but I think it's good to think about things like, too, like what if he had checked, and I think the answer would have been to check back on the flop and call once on the turn. Um, if uh, Villa had checked the turn, then I would have bet the turn for value, planning on betting most rivers for value. If he had led the turn, I would have called the turn, and then depending on the exact river card and the bet size, I would have either... Uh, folded or called or if he checked then depending on the run out the board texture I would have had probably a pretty tough decision between value betting again and not. I wasn't posturing here I don't think I was just kind of taking notes and wasn't extremely worried about getting timed out because I uh, wasn't going to call anyway. Okay, and here we've got a, a close one, I think. We can either go for the ISO or we can just complete. Um, I think since we're out of position, our hand isn't quite as strong. We know that we don't have that much pre-flop fold equity. Completing makes more sense. And we shouldn't, there shouldn't be a lot of ace-x hands in our opponent's ranges here. So I think this lead is fine. Um, if you don't want to lead here, I think that'd be okay too because we have really no equity. Um, so if we're going to lead some of the time, not all of the time, we may as well wait until we do have equity. Uh, but if the spot is super good, so good that we can just bet like our entire range, then we don't need to worry about things like how much equity we do or don't have. I mean, if we feel like we're going to get enough folds um, for the price that we lay, or are laying ourselves really, then we just go for it. Um, and here we check the uh, pair of sevens back because I think it's more like showdown value. And we're not worried about a spade rolling off because we've got the nut flush draw if it does. And I think that decision ends up saving us a bet because if once we checked back and we saw it go back call, we can pretty uh, happily and confidently fold our pair of sevens. So I wanted to get some examples 
into this video, but I really wanted to keep this at about 15 minutes. Um, and I'm going to make this uh, probably a three-parter. A two-parter or a three-parter. Probably a two-parter, actually. Um, there's a lot of interesting spots that came up later on in this uh, in this match. And uh, I'd like to look at them. There's some uh, squeeze spots, some ISO spots, and uh, some you know more value lines and some uh, some situations where the stack sizes and the ICM considerations really dictated the play. And that's something that I think uh, a lot of players could work on. I think it's uh, lacking in a lot of uh, small stakes players' games. Um, and uh, I think I know enough about it to uh, give you at least kind of a, a beginner's uh, look at ICM. Well, an ICM, if you don't know, independent chip modeling. Uh, it just refers to uh, how, how much value the chips that you have, the chips that you lose, and the chips that you gain have based on the payout structure. I mean, so like if you're playing a winner takes all tournament with ICM EV or like chip EV and uh, uh, TEV are the same. Like tournament EV and normal EV are the same. But as soon as you introduce a pay structure, uh, in an extreme example, if you're playing a satellite where uh, first, second, and third place are all the same prize, uh, then I mean, they're actually end up being some situations where it's correct to fold pocket aces before the flop, which you would never do um, if uh, if you weren't thinking in terms of ICM. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. ICM becomes um, a more pressing issue as you get closer to the bubble. And uh, as more of the hands you play could potentially be all end hands. So basically the more shallow the stack depth gets, and the closer you get to the bubble, the more bubble pressure uh, is a factor, and the more ICM considerations should help dictate your overall decision making process. Um, so I think, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, if you have any questions, post them. And if there's anything you'd like, uh, you know, you'd like to know about, like to hear about, if you're curious or have questions about different aspects, um, definitely let me know in the comments. I'd be happy to get back to you. Um, maybe even make a video on the topic that you're, uh, that you're most interested in. If you're interested in some coaching, I've got some uh, availability. Um, I did pick up a couple students, but they're not taking up a tremendous amount of time at this point. Um, and I've got even some kind of uh, free and nearly free coaching opportunities that I've been uh, thinking about doing anyway. Uh, so yeah, if you have any interest in coaching whatsoever, um, I think I might do something like your your first session free um, or like a coaching session uh, where my fee would just be a piece of the action for whatever tournament um, you're playing when we do our sweat session for instance. Where it's not free, but you know it doesn't cost you anything unless you actually win, sort of a thing. We'll just uh, get to the end of this hand, which I'll certainly be playing. I mean, I don't think there's anything that could happen that would have me just folding this preflop. Another limp, another ISO. We are in position. We've got a player that we have a skill edge on. Uh, we've probably got some fold equity pre-flop and uh, then again post-flop. So the only question becomes how do we size our bet? And we have to size our bet based on not just the player stack that we're playing against, but we have to look around the table and size our bets you know, based on the stack sizes around the table. And we'll be talking about bet sizing and stack sizes more um, as we start getting towards the end of this tournament, which we're kind of in the middle end stages now. Um, here we just have a very clear value bet, and if we get shoved on, we just stack it off. Because there'll be draws and probably worse jack X in our opponent's range is often enough to make it a profitable call with the pot odds. You know, I'm not going to be thrilled about it. It goes like check, bet, fold, raise, all in. 
but I'm not going to fold either. Well, okay, I guess that's probably not going to happen, is it? Yeah, I think that's a good point to wrap it up on. Let's see what this joker does. I'm assuming he's just going to time bank and fold. I don't remember. Uh, and that's exactly what he does. So, yeah, until next time, guys. Navanad. Over and out. Good.